Welcome to The Epic Life with Pastor Bob Hallman. We invite you to listen to this timeless and inspirational message from God's Word. May the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthen your heart today. It's such an important component of the gospel is understanding uh, God's indignation toward sin. And so let's take a look at the, the text itself and then we'll consider its application to our life this morning, beginning in verse 18 of chapter 1 in Romans, if you've got your Bibles open, which I hope you do, or your smartphone or your tablet. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Father, we we come before you this morning with just hearts that are so thankful, God, for your kindness to us in speaking the truth. God, we're so thankful that you love us enough to tell us the reality and not the fantasy. Father, we're so thankful that that you care for us and you made a way through Christ to deliver us from our sin and that you have raised us up and seated us in the heavenly places with Christ and that you've given us much love because we've been forgiven much. And I pray as we study this text this morning, God, that you would uh, cause our hearts to lean in to the scripture and that our hearts would respond with a yes and amen before we even know its application to us today. And so, Father, have your way. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Uh, There may be some that aren't, uh, aren't Christians here today and that are kind of exploring the possibility. I pray they would receive Christ today. And for the rest of us who are believers, as the Romans were believers that received this letter, I pray this section of Scripture would come alive for us and that you would use it to advance your cause in our life and your cause in the world, and your cause in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these wonderful things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. There you go. Was that a little amen back there somewhere I heard? (laughs) So cute. Sounds like it was autumn. So Paul is writing the church in Rome, and he's communicating them his appreciation for their faith and love that's, that's worldwide, in its scope, people are aware of the, the church in Rome and the work that God is doing there. Uh, and the church in Rome becomes the thesis statement of Paul's doctrine of theology about the gospel of salvation. 
It's the most profound book that we have in the New Testament, and frankly, the Bible, uh, that focuses in on the very simple truth, complex in some respects, but very simple in truth, that the Christian life is a, a life of faith in the finished work of God from first to last. And the righteous will live by that faith in God alone from beginning to end of our life. So the moment that we receive Christ to the moment that we breathe our last, it's a life of faith in the finished and completed work of Christ, not based on our performance or our uh, uh, excelling or our achieving or our transformation, but it's a completed work in Christ. And out of that transformation, as Paul is going to talk about and share with us in Romans 12, out of that transformation is birthed a transformation of our life and a love relationship with God that's expressed by offering ourselves as living sacrifices to a holy, pure, and perfect God who loves us with an everlasting love. It's an amazing gospel. And so we're on a journey in this book, but Paul begins uh, with a, 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 almost a sense of lurching into this concept of the wrath of God. And when you're talking about the love of Christ, uh, beginning with the wrath of God doesn't seem like a logical beginning, but I, I pray that by the time we're done, you'll understand how not only logical it is, but necessary it is. And I would phrase it this way, is that uh, the father heart of God is a great physician. And as a great physician, he has to bring us news of the malady before he can interest us in the remedy. No one's interested in a, in a remedy when they don't know that anything's wrong. I mean, imagine if we, we do a lot of fun things in our church. We're very creative. We have a lot of kind of out-of-the-box things that we've done over the years that are just joyful and fun and uh, draw the body together and, and just give us really incredible memories together. But what if I said that after church, we're all going down to Long's Drugs and I, you know, I want everybody to spend at least $5 on a drug. We're going to come back up to here to church and have a lunch and afterwards, we're just going to, we're going to take random drugs uh, that we buy down at Long's Drugs. Uh, just for fun, because, you know, well, it'd be interesting. You'd have to admit it's creative. Nobody's ever done it before. We've never had that event as a church. Well, it's ab absolutely foolish, of course, because we don't buy things that are remedies unless we know there's a problem. This last week, I, um, I, I uh, received my test results, my uh, all my blood tests and everything for my annual physical. Uh, honestly, if, I, if my wife didn't tell me to have an annual physical and schedule it, I probably wouldn't, not because I'm against it, but because I'm just so busy. It's like one of those things that probably just wouldn't get scheduled. So she schedules it. I go in for my annual physical, and every year it's just, I'm not bragging or anything, but it's just like I get perfect scores on everything. And my doctor is like, how can you be your age, because I'm 73 right now. Uh, he said, how can you be this old and have the blood tests of like a 20-something-year-old. And he says, based on the actuary and your blood things and the, the tests and everything, you're going to live to be like, you know, uh, in your late 90s. And I said, well, my family kind of lives that long. Uh, that's kind of in the genes. Well, uh, it was interesting because I got all my blood tests, took all the work, did the fasting and all that, and then I got my results on Thursday. So the results come in, and if you know with Wilcox, you can actually, they send them to you, you can look them up online. So I'm looking them, and you know, they're all just the same as they always have been. Until I got the last test. The last test came in two days later, popped up on the screen, and I thought I was, you know, had all my tests in. And the last test came in, it was a PSA. Some of you guys know what the PSA, it's a prostate test, testing for cancer and for enlarged prostate. And, uh, and I've got these scores that are like 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Uh, you want to be somewhere between 0 and 1, or 3.5 is, is, is normal. And, uh, and 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, boom, just like that, this last year. And I'm 328. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> the prostate guys are like, what? I can't be. Because uh, they know. Um, but it's a 9.9. .9. And so in that, in that time frame, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at that, and right in my mind, a few things go through my mind. Is that they must have made a mistake. That's the first thing that went through my mind. The second thing that went through my mind is that I'm, on, I'm supposed to be fasting, but I was so thirsty, and I was so tired of drinking, drinking water, is I got one of those uh, zero Gatorade things with no calories, and I took some slurps of that. So I thought, I wonder if, if maybe that spiked my PSA test. And all that lasted for about maybe 30 seconds, all of that dialogue in my head, maybe not even that long. And I realized, you know, I think I've been sensing that something's not quite right for a while. 
And I think I do have a high PSA. So I, I accepted it. The other thing I could have done at that moment is I could have said, that doctor, I won't mention who he is because now I'm saying something mean about him and he's a great doctor, but it must be that doctor. You know, he must have it out for me. He's always trying to, he, he keeps talking about my, per, he, he probably is envious of my scores and spiked it himself somehow, you know, get that up there just to make, just to make himself feel better. I could have that kind of a response. I could kind of curl up into a ball and go into emotional paralysis over the possibilities of what that might mean. Or I could cooperate in partnership with my physician for a remedy. That's what I chose to do. And, and beyond that, because I'm a Christian, I'm actually kind of excited about this test score because every time something like this happens, and you guys remember my, my uh, hernia story, I love the hernia, it was like awesome. I had a hernia, I got to get it fixed, I got to witness to so many people, it was a blessing. I've got these three little tattoos on my stomach now, people ask about it, it's like, I gotta tell you about what God did with my hernia. And it's not the hernia, it's the glory of God, it's how he used it to advance his kingdom. So I fully expect that this is gonna be just like that. It's an opportunity, it's a new platform for me that I have never been on before, to park myself in a position to be able to bring attention and honor to God. And so my heart is not upset. My heart's not uh, 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 resistant. Instead, I'm like, okay, I've seen the test. I understand that something's not quite right. You have my full cooperation. And I don't know exactly what it means. It's probably gonna mean some sort of surgery and probably some medication and treatment. But it's like, whatever it is, I can guarantee you that my heart is like, I'm fully on board. Let's work together, doctor. What do we have to do? You've got my full attention and my full cooperation. I accept the diagnosis and I am completely open to your expertise and the remedy. And in essence, what we have in this text in the same way, uh, a person has to be convinced of their guilt before they will be interested in God's forgiveness. They have to be aware of the danger before they'll be interested in God's way of escape and deliverance and they have to understand God's wrath before they can appreciate the salvation of God. And so Paul begins in the right place with the wrath of God. He begins to explain God's distaste and disfavor and his judicial responsibility to judge and adjudicate sin. And so he lays it right out and he gives us in the opening chapter of, of Romans, the malady. He gives us the bad news so that we can receive the good news. I, I will say that as a young Christian, uh, I had this, uh, this wrong approach in sharing my faith, and I kind of shared Jesus Christ as kind of the guy that changed your life, made it better, uh, that he's gonna bless you, and, uh, and he's gonna be with you, and he'll love you for eternity, and then you have heaven to boot. And I had friends that would actually say to me, and it completely just, I just got, I was dumbfounded by what to say next. They said, well, I'm already happy. I, I'm already peaceful. They're not Christians, but they, they, were ha they basically were confessing they had everything that I was proposing that they needed. The problem was is that I didn't present the bad news. I didn't present the reality of how darkened a man's heart is separate from Christ. I didn't communicate the wrath of God being poured out on all ungodliness in this present day, but also in the age to come, and that there is a price to pay, and every man and woman will have to stand before the judge before the creator God and give an account for their life as to what they did with the savior Jesus Christ. And since that time, I've become aware of, uh, of ministries like Ray Comfort's ministry, The Way of the Master. How many of you know his name or have seen his material or read his book? I highly recommend his book, The Way of the Master by Ray Comfort, because his whole philosophy and his whole approach of sharing the gospel is you have to give them the bad news. And the way that you give them the bad news is by addressing their conscience with the Ten Commandments. And you go through one by one the Ten Commandments. Have you ever stolen anything? You know, even a paperclip, something from your office, some money. Did you ever take anything in, in, your, in the scope of your life? Have you ever stolen anything? And everyone says yes. Well, that makes you a what? Well, I guess that makes me a thief. Have you ever lied? Well, everyone's lied. What does that make you? That makes you a liar. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? and used his name as a curse word or under your breath or even in your thoughts. Well, we all probably have. That makes us what? A blasphemer. Have any of us lusted any time in our life? 
for another person, for a sexual relationship or something inappropriate. The truth is that all of us have done that at one time or another. What does that make us? That makes us adulterers. So by the profession and confession of our own mouth, we're thieving, lying, blasphemous adulterers at heart. And so why in the world would God let us into his perfect kingdom that is vacant of sin? And so that becomes the platform of using the Ten Commandments to help someone have their conscience touched in a way where they recognize the malady. And the malady is us. And the malady is sin. And the result is, is that God was going to pour out his wrath, uh, justifiably so, on the sinful heart of unrepentant man. And so he begins in verse 18, and he says that the wrath of God is being revealed against all godlessness and wickedness. These, uh, this, this wrath is interesting. There are two words in the Greek for wrath. One word is thumos, which is a, an agitated, explosive rage, uncontrolled, passionate, uh, you know, vindictive rage. And then you've got another word, which is actually the word used here, because God is not passionate in that sense. He's not uncontrolled, and he's not in a rage. But he does have the word orge uh, in his heart at times. It's a subtle, determined indignation that expresses itself in ju judicial, appropriate action. So God, as a righteous judge, is angry at sin, but it's a controlled anger that focuses in on a proper adjudication of the person who's in violation. And that, uh, that anger is directed toward those who are godless. Uh, that has to do with character and are expressing that character in their actions in wickedness. And it's always in that order. Uh, God, godly people don't express wickedness and wicked people can't express godliness. But a person who's ungodly can express wickedness and a person who's godly can express righteousness. In this case, Paul is addressing those people that have a malady. And the malady is ungodliness in the core of their very being. And so he goes right to the heart of this issue. And then he says they express it through their wicked conduct and behavior. He goes on in verse 18 and says that the reason for God's wrath is that man has suppressed the truth. They've held it down. They've suppressed it. They've held in their sin. They are hiding it. They're covering it up. They're doing everything that they can to conceal it from themselves and from other people and especially from God. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, as Paul is writing the church there, that they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so to be saved. So now we know what the problem is with those that suppress the truth is they refuse the truth. They know the truth. They can perceive the truth, but they reject it because of their wicked behavior. It's in conflict with their lifestyle, and so they reject the truth of God. And so God tells us that he has made himself known to us in a variety of ways. Uh, the Bible uh, tells us in, in Psalm 19 two ways in which he's made himself known, and they're theological terms, but one is general revelation. It's a theological term for creation. All that we see, all that we perceive uh, points to a creator, that this didn't happen by itself, but there is someone to whom we bow the knee, someone to whom we are responsible that has authority over our lives. And of course, that someone is the creator God. But we also have revelation through special revelation. And that is a term that's devoted to an understanding that this book, by, given by the Spirit of God and, uh, and transcribed by the apostles and the writers of the Bible, uh, have given us now this special revelation. It's extraordinary. It's not natural. It's extraordinary. It's supernatural, given and appointed by God that we might know God and have the truth of God and know how to walk in the will of God. And so Psalm 19 tells us about this, this concept of God making the truth known to even people that don't know much about the Bible or they don't have a missionary or they've never heard someone come and actually preach and explain the cross. Psalm 19 says this, verses one through four. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. This is God's answer biblically as to what happens to people that have never heard the gospel. 
they will be responsible for the revelation that God has given them and for the knowledge that they do have. I find it interesting that um, uh, you may know the name Helen Keller. I'm not sure any of our Bible college students know that name. Know the name Helen Keller from, okay, they're like, what are you talking about? We, 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 we know history. Okay, good, good for you, good on you. Okay, so Helen Keller, born in 1880, died in 1968 when I was eight years old. I, I'm not 73, by the way. I know some of you probably need to have that clarified. I just gave it away by my age there. So, uh, and she died in 1968. Well, Helen Keller was uh, not completely unusual. She was unique in some, some respect, but there were a lot of disabled people in her day. But what, what happened with her life and, and the, the remarkable uh, learning and, and uh, uh, progress that she made through her tutor was astonishing and really turned uh, the disabled community and the whole perspective that people had about disabilities on its head. And uh, of course, she was deaf, blind, and dumb. And everybody put her in a home and thought, well, she's just going to be a vegetable the rest of her life. Well, Ann Sullivan take, took on the responsibility of helping her, became her tutor, and helped her overcome each one of these disabilities. And uh, when Ann got to the point that she was able to communicate with the words and the verbiage, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ to Helen, Helen exclaimed back to her, she said, I already know him, I just didn't know his name. Isn't that interesting? So here, this is anecdotal, but the, here's a woman that's expressing the same concept through, through general revelation, even someone that has no instruction or teaching or capacity to even receive the gospel, has a knowledge of the creator God and knows that he's to be served and worshiped. And Helen knew that. And for the first time, she finally knew the name of Jesus Christ and embraced him as the God of her life already, but now with the name that she could pronounce and recognize. And the result is that the Bible tells us that men are without excuse. No one can claim to not know God. The special revelation that God has given us is found in the same Psalm in verses seven through 11 of, of uh, chapter 19 of Psalms, where the Psalmist says that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Wow, that, that's a good word for us, reviving our soul. It's trustworthy, making wise the simple. It's right, giving joy to the heart. Radiant, giving light to the eyes. It's pure, enduring forever. It's altogether righteous. It's more valuable than gold and silver, and it's sweeter than honey on the comb. And by these commandments, the servants of God are warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. There's this major blessing that's associated with both natural revelation and special revelation. And mankind is responsible for that across the globe, across language barriers, cultural barriers, race barriers. And God says they know enough to walk in the truth. But because of man's rejection of God, they refuse to do two things in verse 21. They refuse to glorify him as God or give him thanks. I find it's very interesting that these are the two markers that distinguish someone that rejects the truth from someone that embraces it. The one that rejects it refuses to glorify God. They refuse to bow the knee. They refuse to bring themselves under authority of God. They refuse to allow anyone to dictate or, or have influence over their life. They refuse to submit to the creator of the universe. And simultaneously, they refuse to give thanks to God for what he's done. You know, the Bible tells us in, in the book of um, James that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And when you think about your life, and I think about my life, I think, wow, the multitude of things we have to be thankful for. I mean, it's just, we, if, if we just tackled that list today, instead of buying drugs at Long's Drugs, and we spent the afternoon doing that, we, we would not have enough time to thank God for everything he's done. If you go back to your childhood and you go back to the fact that you were given birth, the fact that he ordained before time that you would be born and that you would live here, that you would be visiting here, that you would be married, that you would have children and you would have grandchildren, that you would have vocational abilities, that you would have skill sets that would be valuable to other people, that you would be able to engage in a life that's meaningful and satisfying. And then you think about all the things that haven't happened to you, that could have happened to you, that didn't. I mean, the, the list of thanksgiving is endless, but not for people that reject God because they cannot, they cannot thank a God that they have refused to glorify. 
And that's the culture that we're living in today. The result, verse 21, is that their thinking became futile. This is the penalty. Their foolish hearts were darkened and they claimed to be wise, but became fools. It's an amazing thing to, to actually think that, especially as a Christian now, knowing what I know, knowing what you know as believers, it's, a, it's a quite an amazing thing to imagine that there was the day, because there was the day, there was the time when all of us thought we were smarter than God, right? And sometimes we still think we're smarter than God. I, I'm sure there are times when I think I'm smarter than God. I give advice to God occasionally. Uh, if, if you've never done that, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, pretty futile. But it's fun to do at times where you just have to give God your two cents about what you think would be the best course of action. You know, we're not telling him what to do, but we're nudging him. And we're saying, this would be a really good, you know, I've thought about this a lot, God. And uh, you've probably been busy and haven't had as much time, but I've been really giving this some thought. And I've got like three solutions but here's my preference and here's why. And I can approach God sometimes like I approach a a staff meeting. And uh, uh, that's foolishness. But but every time that we do that, we're, we're, we're behaving as a person who's thinking futility in their thought life. And so, uh, Actually, Psalm 14, verse one says that the fool says in their heart, there is no God. They're corrupt, their deeds are vile, and there's no one that does good. And so the person that actually professes this as a lifestyle actually is the most foolish of all. And the result is, is that in verse 23, we're told that they exchanged God for created images. A.W. Tozer said that idolatry begins in the mind when we pervert or exchange ideas of God for something other than what he really is. So it's not just bowing down and worshiping a golden calf. It's not just bowing down and worshiping an object of stone or the Hawaiian gods here that we have in in the islands. It's it's actually replacing God. It's, It's finding worship in God, perverting or even just exchanging the idea of who God is for one of our own making. And I want to tell you that uh, even though this is really written as a platform for evangelism, there's some lessons for us to learn here because that's why the Word of God is so very vital to us that we have God's idea of who God is. Because I can find that myself, at times, I can be uh, convinced by circumstances or by hardship or by suffering or by challenges. And sometimes I can look at those things that I'm going through and I can give a different perspective on the nature and character of God and I can begin to question his character and his devotion and his love and his faithfulness and those kinds of things. So anytime we begin to pervert or change who God really is, we are embracing and fiddling around with idolatry. So it's really important that we know God and that we know his word so that we have a proper perspective and that we put into motion this life of faith where we put our confidence in the word of God. Again, faith is not, ooh, I believe, I believe, I believe. No, faith is simply taking God at his word. That's all that faith is. It's hearing the promise of God, hearing the declaration of God, hearing the heart of God, hearing the truth of God, and saying, I agree, and I'm in all the way. You've got full partnership from me, Dr. Jesus. No... No whining here, no complaining here, no denial here. I know the problem. The problem is me, and you're the solution. And whatever you want to do and whatever you say, I embrace with my whole heart. But not the, not the person that's wicked that suppressed the truth. Instead, they begin to worship mortal men. It's interesting if you look at the, in this, in this text in verse 23, the degradation, the devolution of the worship of man when God is not worshiped. It begins with himself and then moves on to birds and flying animals, storks and hawks that are kind of noble. And then you've got animals, and these are the animals that were worshiped in Egypt, the bull, the cat, the hippo, the dung beetle, now we're getting low. And then the flies, that's really low. But it gets even lower because then they start worshiping reptiles. And you know, that, that points right back to the story in Genesis of Satan. And this is the devolution of a lifestyle of rejecting God. Well, in verse 24, it says something very tragic. I'm not saying these are the most tragic words in the Bible, but I would rank them up in the top 10 at least. God gave them over. I have this picture in my mind, it's not hard to imagine, of God standing in front of an unbeliever and appealing 
and exhorting and sending messengers and prophets and teachers and grandmas and family members and friends and strangers on the street to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he keeps appealing and appealing and appealing and he uses music and he uses circumstances and he even uses suffering in our life to bring us to the, the, the end of ourselves so that we can receive the remedy. But we deny, we curl up and refuse the diagnosis from the great physician. And the result is, is that because of our persistence and our, and our rejection of the great physician and the remedy, God gives people over. It's like he steps out of the way at some point and he says, okay, I'm gonna honor the free will that I've given you and I'm gonna let you plunge deeper into the life of sin and immorality. There are only two kinds of people, C.S. Lewis said. He says, there are those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. The same phrase, but so very different depending on who is speaking that phrase. And God does give people over. He gives them over indirectly through circumstances in their life. Uh, he removes his protective hand. He allows consequences of sin to take their inevitable uh, toll and uh, direction, a uh, destructive course in our life. And we know what sin does. It degrades man, strips him of dignity and peace of mind and a clear conscience. It destroys personal relationships and marriages and families. It ruins cities and nations. It leads people to loneliness and frustration and meaninglessness and despair that we find so prevalent today. Those are the indirect consequences of God removing himself from standing in the way of a sinner. But we certainly have very direct consequences that we've seen historically. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were given a death sentence as a result of their sin. The destruction of mankind during the flood was a very direct judgment of God against mankind in Genesis 6 and 7. Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter uh, 18 and 19. The destruction of Pharaoh and his army in the book of Exodus. And you fast forward and you see it again and again where God directly expresses his wrath against ungodliness. One of the clearest expressions that we have in the entire Bible is the cross of Christ, where the entire wrath of God for all of human suffering and sin and degradation and immorality and impurity and rejection of God was all laid on Christ in that time on the cross. And the full expression of that wrath for every sin ever committed, past, present, and future, was laid upon the shoulders of our Savior. And those that refuse that gift are facing the book of Revelation, where again, we have a direct expression of God's wrath. And so the idea that God is okay with sin and that God winks at sin and that God is just so loving and, and lovable and so soft-hearted that everyone's gonna make it in is a foolish, futility fantasy. It doesn't exist. It's not in the Bible. And so Paul goes on and he gives greater clarity to this issue. And he says, God gave them over to what? Sexual impurity. The, uh, the aspect of expressing sexual intimacy with someone that's not your spouse and not someone of the opposite sex. So God has designed uh, intercourse to be experienced by a man and a woman in the commitment of a relationship and a marriage. And outside of that is sexual immorality. So any expression of of sexual activity outside of that falls outside of the bounds of God's design. But it goes on to say they moved into false worship, which was already discussed. They changed the truth of God for a lie. And they began to worship the creation versus the creator. And of course, we see evidence of that uh, in our envi environmentalist uh, you know, agenda, uh, some of which I agree with and some of which is very clearly an ideology and a religion and goes far beyond simply caring for the earth and goes to a rejection of the true creator God and uh, the true creator Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And as a result in verse 26 and seven, we have more evidence of God doing something that is frightening to me because it says that because of this, he turned them over even to greater degradation of themselves by committing shameful acts of lust, female homosexuality and ma male homosexuality. Now, it's interesting, the people that uh, Paul is writing in the book of Romans, uh, most people know this, but not everyone does, that uh, homosexuality was rampant in Rome at that time. 
most of the great philosophers and poets at that time, including Socrates and many others, they were all homosexuals. The first 14 of the first 15 emperors were all homosexuals. So he was writing a culture that was just completely inundated with this lifestyle of same-sex relationship. And he speaks to it so boldly right in this text. And, uh, and because of that, we speak to it boldly as well. In the Bible, we have evidence that God condemns homosexuality. The act, the lifestyle of homosexuality is condemned in Leviticus 18.22. Under the Old Covenant, it was punishable by death, Leviticus 20, 13. In the New Testament, we're told again and again and again that those who persist in a lifestyle of homosexuality will be excluded from heaven. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, 1 Timothy 1, Jude 7, and in the book of Revelation. So how should we approach this as Christians? Well, what I would say is let's approach it like we do anything else. That, uh, you know, contrary to the effort of uh, of sometimes the homosexual community to say it's genetic and they can't help it and they were born this way. There's absolutely no evidence to that fact at all. Uh, to the contrary, we have evidence in the Bible that it's a choice. And so I would say that uh, homosexuality is no different than the temptations that people have for adultery or immorality or for murder uh, or for thieving. No one is born this way, but we take on these characteristics and these, uh, these choices that we make in life and so the good news about it is that uh, like all the other sins that a man or woman can commit, many of which we have committed along the way, as Paul said, we once were like this, that we, we repented and because of God's forgiveness, we weren't stuck, we could be set free. And so everyone in the lifestyle, including those that are homosexual, can be set free. And that's absolutely wonderful, incredible news is that there is no place where God's redemptive work can't reach. And so again, I'm, I know I'm emphasizing this again, but there is such a rampant problem with immorality in our culture. But we don't blame that on genetics. And that can be, we can be delivered from that. We don't have to walk in that. And so we might have a propensity for it. We might have a history in our family for it. We might even claim that we've been cursed by our, our, our previous generations and that we're, we're carrying some sort of a curse. But the fact is, is that any man and any woman at any time under the power and influence of a transformed life with the spirit of God and with the word of God can be transformed and set free and delivered from all immorality and any sin that, uh, that might plague them. And this is the promise of God. And so we can be set free. We've got people in our congregation here who have been set free. We've got leaders in our church who have been set free from that lifestyle of homosexuality. And I praise God for it. I've got lots of friends in this community. We've, we're open to the community of uh, the homosexual community. One of the prime leaders um, that was a part of the community here, he's since moved, but uh, we, I was close friends with him and I would go down to uh, uh, down to Kealia Beach where they would congregate probably once a month at least. I'd go down and spend time with them and take an interest in them and love them and answer their biblical questions. And they knew I was a pastor. The first time I went through, man, I was just like, I, it was bad. I mean, walking up there, it was like, you know, uh, the, the, the Grinch who stole Christmas arrived, you know. Uh, but after I was there for a while, they really delighted to have me there because I would care for them and pray for them and take an interest in them and share the gospel with them. And I was able to communicate the gospel. I remember the first person that I, that I met that was actually impacted by that lifestyle with this consequence of this penalty of the perversion that's uh, mapped out in verse 27 when AIDS showed up on the scene in the late Eight, uh, 19, I almost said 1880s. Uh, in, 19, in 1980, in the late uh, 80s, probably 88, 89, 90, around there, I got a call. I was in upstate New York. I was a past, pastoring a church. I was an associate pastor there. And I got a call from a social worker, and they said, could you go see this lady? Uh, and uh, she's calling for help. They've called a lot of churches and pastors, and no one will go see her. And I'm like, that, that's strange. And, and then she began to, the, the bombs began to drop in the phone call. Well, she's dying, and, uh, and she's got a very communicable disease, but we're not exactly sure how it's communicated, and uh, she has AIDS. And so this is when nobody knew much about AIDS, and, and it was being predicted as this global phenomena that was going to sweep across the world like the Black Plague. Some of you remember uh, those early days. There was no remedy. In fact, no one even knew how it was transmitted. And I was left with this, with this choice to, uh, to respond. And in that moment, 
on that phone, God said, go. So I, I got on the phone with a couple of guys from the church and I said, hey, you wanna go with me on, a, on an adventure of a lifetime? We're gonna go and we're gonna go minister to this woman. Short story is we went and, uh, and the first thing that she saw me, she probably weighed 75 pounds. You know, she was probably about 5'4", but you can imagine she was just skin and bones, lesions, uh, just, just a mess. And, uh, and her house was a mess and she was clearly on death's door. And I went right in and, and God said, I want you to love this woman. So I went right up to her and I gave her a big bear hug, you know? And I, and I knew uh, that there was a real possibility because of my total ignorance and everyone else's ignorance about AIDS that I could easily contract something and die. I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I knew God told me to love her and God told me to go. And so I trusted him and, uh, and obeyed him. And, and this woman just completely fell apart. And she says, I haven't been touched or hugged in six months. Everyone's afraid of me. They push food, the social services push through food through the door. Everybody's terribly frightened of her. We spent about two hours with her and shared the love of Christ with her. We didn't need to convince her of the, of the diagnosis. She needed a remedy and we offered the gospel and that woman received Christ as her savior that day. And you know that, that encounter with that experience completely changed me in my thinking about people that struggle with that lifestyle. And I, I've done a lot of research and study on it and to try to be more effective in, in being a blessing in that arena to people that struggle. And I have a tremendous amount of compassion and tenderheartedness toward people that are trapped in that lifestyle. It's a very difficult lifestyle. It's a very lonely lifestyle. It's a very uh, isolating lifestyle. And it's a very sinful and painful lifestyle. And it leads to perversity that destroys people's lives. But God gives people over to this lifestyle. And if that weren't bad enough, in verse 28, it says that God gave them over to a depraved mind. A depraved mind. This is a, a depraved mind is a, is a mind that fails the test, no longer functions properly. And uh, it's been really interesting. The men of our fellowship, is, as Alex was talking about, we've been going through the series on, on purity. And part of the series has been tackling an issue that I've heard before and read some on before, but not with such clarity or force or detail. And it has to do with the, the neural pathways of neuroscience and how we build these pathways uh, that are, in essence create habits. And you can almost think of a path. Like I go pig hunting out here and, uh, and I, can, I can find where the well-worn path is is the place that I need to be. That's where the pigs are gonna be. So I'm looking for those well-worn paths. How does, how does the path get well-worn? Well, the pigs use it all the time. And what happens in, in our minds when we use our minds for sin, for sin and, and disregarding God and rejecting the truth is that we build a pathway through the neural pathway using uh, um, serotonin and uh, dopamine, those two chemicals that are released in our body that kind of create pleasure. And, we, and once we go down those pathways and we find pleasure, we wanna go down that pathway again and again and again, even if that pathway is sinful. And what they found fascinating stuff and this is just in the last 10 years or so, but what they're finding is they take MRIs of brain imaging, they're finding that these pathways are so pronounced and profound in addicts and people that uh, do porn, and, and I would say people that have a sinful lifestyle in general, that it's so profound that it has to be undone over a period of time, though God can forgive sin, the rebuilding of pathways and new habits takes a period of time to have that happen. We know that from experience, but now we're finding neuro neurologically that that's true. They also did a side-by-side -side comparison of, of uh, brain scans of a drug addict with somebody that looks at porn. And what's interesting is that when you look at a normal brain, it's very, it's clean, it's healthy looking, it's, the color is right, and it's, uh, it's symmetrical. But when you look at a, a, a person that's addicted to drugs or porn, it looks like it looks like it koho olave. It looks like it got bombed. There are craters everywhere in the brain, and it actually damages the brain to walk in sin. It actually causes a person to be depraved and for their actual physical capacity to think and to function to be diminished. I never knew that. I just thought he was saying that spiritually depraved. But he's actually saying that when, when a person walks in this lifestyle, God actually gives them over to experience the physical, cerebral consequences of living in sin. And so they commit, as it says in verse 29 through 31, every kind of sin. I, I've, I've read this to you, but the list is daunting. Mankind's response in verse 32. 
despite God's warning, despite God's diagnosis, they reject him. They fail to give him glory and they refuse to give him thanks and they rush headlong into a continued lifestyle of sin. You know, First John tells us, because again, Paul is writing to Rome. He's writing to a church. He's not writing, this is not a treatise to the, to the philosophers. This is not a treatise to the Roman governors or to the, uh, to the leadership of Rome. This is to a church. And, and this is what First John says to the Christians in verse, uh, chapter three, verse six through 10. No one who lives in Christ keeps on sinning. No one who continues in sin has either seen him or known him. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So here's, here's, the, here's the, the bad news. Let me give you the bad news first. The bad news is, is that God's pronounced his adjudication on sinful mankind. And he says, if you live this way, you're outside the kingdom of God. That's the bad news. The good news is that we can be transformed and the evidence of transformation, again, the evidence of salvation, we don't get saved because we're good. The evidence of that transformation and that salvation is that we begin to live a new life. And here's the crazy thing. You remember about the depraved mind? This is what the Bible says, that when a man or woman receives Christ, they are given the mind of Christ. Isn't that amazing? A supernatural healing begins to take place in the, in the mind of a believer. And God begins to heal and restore their mind. And then the Bible says that not only does that restoration begin, but we have a partnership in it because he says, as we read this word on a daily basis, it washes our minds and renews our minds through the power of God. And so we have an obligation and an opportunity on a daily basis to wash our minds and build new neural pathways that are not based in sin, but those old defunct lifestyles that we once participated in become overgrown and weed ridden and pretty soon it all just becomes a part of the lawn and you can't even see it anymore. It's not there anymore because you've bought and built into new neural pathways of following God and obeying God and loving God and serving God and suddenly now those are the new habits in your life because of this transforming work of God. So we have this privilege to partner in it but those that reject God, not only do they continue in it, but they say, uh, in addition, uh, Paul says that they approve of those who practice them. So they give applause to people that join their ranks in their perversion. They've penetrated the, the fields of education and medicine and media and politics and virtually every vocational arena you can imagine. And they are doing their very best to create a society that rejects God. Well, it's a very futile effort. That's part of the futility that's expressed is that they think they can actually conquer God. Have you ever thought and wondered to yourself how stupid Satan must be? Have you ever had that thought? The guy's gotta be an idiot. He knows the Bible. He knows the Bible. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the power of God. He knows that he's a created being. He knows he doesn't stand a chance. And yet he persists anyway in futility to try to upend the purposes of God. And in the same way, those that think that they can outsmart God and that they, in their futile efforts, can outdo God and pervert God's created order and his created plan and the second coming of Christ and the, the culmination of all things and the creation of the new heaven and the new earth, it's coming, it's coming. It's a futile effort. And so those of us that are believers have this great confidence that we can walk in is that God's work will not be thwarted or undone by the efforts of man. And so we have Paul's diagnosis. It's the diagnosis of God from Genesis to the book of Revelation that sin will destroy a person's life. That's our problem. And we have a choice. We can deny it and say, that's not my test. You must've gotten me mixed up with somebody else. I'm not that bad. We might refuse to cooperate with the doctor and say, not buying it. You've got some agenda. You're harsh, you're mean, you're cruel. That's why you're telling me these things. We can curl up in a ball and say, well, I am what I am. You made me this way. And so I'm just gonna function like I do. It's the best I can do. You'll just have to be satisfied with it. Or we can do the appropriate thing and say, I'm in full agreement. It's a little bit of a shock to hear it. It's a little surprising to see it on a graph. 
The numbers are a little bothersome, but you have my full attention and you have my full cooperation. And from this moment on, I'm under your authority, under your leadership, and I will give myself to whatever you think will be the appropriate remedy for life. So do you see how important this bad news is? Do you see how important it is that people understand the wrath of God? Because most people think they're not that bad. And I would suggest to you one last thing before we close is that you might be tempted to think you're not that bad as a Christian. The Bible says that the one that has been forgiven much loves much. It's not that we don't have much to be forgiven. It's just that we don't perceive how much we need to be forgiven of. And the result is, is that many of us, even as Christians, and I'll say this for myself, there are times as I prepared this message, I thought to myself, you know, I think I'm a pretty good guy. As a Christian, thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, yes and amen over there. There's one of you. Pregnant pause here for the rest of you to chime in if you choose to. <laughs> so I, th I think as a Christian, I've made a lot of improvements and maybe I'm not so bad until I go back and I read the account of my life before coming to Christ. Just as wicked, just as evil, maybe not guilty of all these sins, but it only takes one sin, one sin in a lifetime to invalidate a person's privilege of being in the kingdom of God. One sin in a lifetime can never be undone by the efforts of the goodwill or the good efforts of the good deeds of one man because that sin can never be washed away except by anything but blood, and in this case, the blood of Christ. So we all come to the foot of the cross destined for hell until we receive this eternal gift of Jesus Christ. But the doctor's in and the blood tests are back and the remedy is available. What a blessed people we are. <laughs> How blessed we are that our minds were not so badly corrupted that we couldn't turn, and yet at the same time so corrupted that the only way we could turn was by the grace of God and by the revelation of God himself that we might see the truth. And so I'm, I'm really taken by this passage and I'm convicted by it, I'm filled with thanksgiving, my heart's filled with compassion that people, for people that are still stuck, and my heart wants to go out and proclaim the gospel to as many people as I can, that they too might be set free. Father, we thank you for this time this morning, and uh, we want to bless your great and holy name. We honor you, and we give you the glory that you deserve, Lord, and we give you the thanks that you deserve. And may our life be expressed in creating new neural pathways that walk in the coolness of the day, in our minds and our hearts and our life with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, may the path that we create in our mind and those neuro pathways that bring so much delight to us that we want to visit again and again and again, move away from a life of sin and into a life of righteousness and joy and peace and comfort and fulfillment and meaning that has everlasting implications. And so, Father, I thank you for this time in your word. I thank you for the men and women here. Pray that you'd bless them. And we want to say thank you, God, for being so good. Thank you for not lying to us. Thank you for not deceiving us. Thank you for having courage to tell us the truth and then providing the remedy in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. May your name be exalted and glorified in our life. And may your gospel go out with power. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say one last thing, and that's that a couple weeks ago, you guys prayed for me, and it made a world of difference for me. And I'm jealous for you to have that same experience so after this service, I want to encourage you guys to pray for each other. Uh, I'm going to be up here. If I can have some of the leaders of the church up here, Bible study leaders, elders, board members, uh, you know, anybody that's got a leadership role, you know, kind of be around in the front area. I've got anointing oil. I don't want anyone going home if you're needing prayer for some, some illness. I don't want anyone going home if you're depressed or lonely or if you're struggling with sin or if you're trying to overcome or you don't know Christ or you've fallen away from your walk with God or you're stuck somehow in your walk with God. I want everyone to experience what I experienced two weeks ago where the body of Christ cared for me and laid hands on me and the next day it just lifted and it was gone. What a blessing. Every one of us should have that. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that today. Talk to each other. Ask, how can I pray for you? and lay hands on each other and bless each other in the name of Christ. And you guys have a great week. And uh, I'm not gonna see you at Long's, but I'll see you soon. I don't know where, but soon. God bless you guys. 
The Epic Life is a listener-supported ministry designed to encourage and equip believers to go big for God by loving Him, loving others, and making disciples. You can visit our website at theepiclife.org. God bless you.